Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have Jairam Ramesh, former minister and now turned historian, biographer, if you will. Jairam, we have this book which you have brought out recently. And I must say it's one of the most reasonable, readable biographies I have read. And it really kept me awake for two nights, for which you are to blame. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. you know, of course, these are two figures I know very well. One, because I was Mrs. Gandhi's guest for one year during emergency. And uh, Haksa Saab, as we all called him, we didn't call him PNH. We called him Haksa Saab because he was the president of Delhi Science Forum, for which, you know, I think we spent about 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. Our Many papers on the Delhi Science Forum in his archives. Okay. So, Jairam, what took, what brought you to write this book? Why did you think it was important for us to know about this aspect? Well, of I've history? long been fascinated by Mr. Aksa. I've never, you know, never met him. I've never known him. But I've long been fascinated by him uh, and the role that he played. Uh, in all the biographies of Indira Gandhi, he stands out. I mean, if you read... Indra Malhotra, if you read uh, Dom Morais, most of all, if you read Catherine Frank, uh, you know, the biographies of Indira Gandhi, he stands out as a crucial figure for that period of 67 to 73. So that's, it's always been on my mind, you know, um, uh, how, you know, who was Mr. Haksa and what did he do? Uh, and um, I just finished writing an environmental biography of Indira Gandhi that came out last year. And during the, my research on Indira Gandhi, I dug and dug and dug and, and excavated a lot of material on Aksa. And then, of course, I was aware through my friend Ram Guha that uh, there was this extraordinary archive which Mr. Haksa left behind in Nehru Memorial. Uh, it was a book waiting to be written. I, I think uh, Mr. Huxa uh, didn't want to write it himself. He didn't write any memoir, unlike his colleagues. But he left behind these papers for some, you know, out-of-work politician to come and write a biography, so to speak. So this is, uh, you know, it's been on my mind for quite some time. And uh, I wouldn't have, by the way, I wouldn't have written this book if there was no archive. That's the important part of this biography. Yes. Because it's a series of vignettes that you have reproduced yes. from his archives. Yes, absolutely. But strung together in a way that it tells a story. I've tried to, you know, I make my contribution is to put a coherent narrative, uh, you know, from, from his birth till his death. Uh, but it is Mr. Huxa speaking. It's, you know, uh, whether he, it's Huxa speaking in college, whether he was in London, whether he was in the diplomatic service, whether he was with Indira Gandhi or post Indira Gandhi in retirement. So, and it's a full length biography, by the way. Uh, there's some material which is not in his archives. For example, uh, he presents a paper uh, at a World Student Assembly in August 1939 in Paris, two weeks before World War II begins. Now, this was during his period when he was a communist, you know. He was an unabashed communist. He re remained an unrepentant Marxist all his life. Uh, and he was then a, a part of the All India Student Federation, AISF. That was, of course, at that time it was not CPI linked. You know, it was an all party. But he was linked to the communist in Great Britain. Yes, yes. British it comes great. This is 19th. Absolutely. I mean, he, he's a, he was a secretary of the district Congress, uh, district CPI in Nagpur, 42, 43. So I was able to discover in the archives in Amsterdam, the International Institute of Social History, a copy of the paper that he presented. Uh, and that assembly was actually funded by Comintern, which is Communist International of the USSR. So a lot of these things I was able to discover, which are not there in his archives. His archives, by the way, cover the period uh, 47 onwards. Uh, uh, they're very, uh, they're very uh, good for uh, 67 onwards, but there's some material from 47 as well. But the, uh, the pre-47 material I found in the British archives. Uh, and some of the material during his foreign service days I found in the national archives. Uh, so this is basically an archival biography. I mean, I didn't. Which is rather surprising. I didn't speak for to his friends. Or, surprising you know. for a political person to do that you really acted like a professional historian. No, you see, uh, the, uh, probably the point is um, uh, I, I believe that Biographies should be scholarship based, you know, they, and they're not hagiography hey, based. And not uh, I've been critical, of the people. Yeah, I've been critical of uh, Mr. Huxley, I've been critical of Indira Gandhi. I mean, you have benefit of hindsight, but I don't want to be judgmental, you know. Uh, and the important thing is to get the primary. We don't have a good tradition. You know, my good friend Nainjot Lahiri, a very good historian, 
one of the greatest historians of ancient India now, uh, she tells me that we don't have a tradition of biography writing in this country. It's all hagiography basically. Coming back to this, I think one of the most important issues that you've dealt with, though it's dealt in the passing really, because I think much more material is waiting outside Haksar archives. It's a Bangladesh issue, Bangladesh war, yes. as it were. You have put the larger picture that how uh, Haksar, Indira Gandhi, of course, Indira Gandhi was the prime mover in that, that they wanted not just a military intervention, and they looked at it in the political sense, that this was a, a geostrategy, it's not about military uh, interventions. It's really about the larger picture. And that's why India was so much so, much so successful yeah. in the way it handled Bangladesh issue. Uh, how do you look at this uh, today? Well, you see, uh, probably um, I plead guilty uh, to the fact that this is not a comprehensive history of 1971 uh, because Gary Bass and more importantly Srinath Raghavan, uh, Srinath Raghavan really has written uh, a comprehensive history of 1971 based on Indian archives, uh, British archives, the US archives, Bangladesh archives and the Soviet archives. So I didn't want to repeat that. Yeah. This is 1971 through the eyes of Haksa. This is 1971. What is Haksa doing in 71? You know, um, with Raw, with the Soviets, with the Bangla Tajuddin Ahmed and his colleagues, uh, with Jay Prakash Narayan and Atal Bihari Vajpayee, who were arguing for strong military, early military intervention, how he was dealing with Manak Shaw and the army, um, and how they were dealing, how he and Indira Gandhi dealt with Nixon, most importantly, uh, his conversations with Kissinger. So, this is all uh, Haksar centric 1971. So to that extent, you're right. It's not a comprehensive history of 1971. But there were many things of 1971 uh, that were not known. I mean, for example, uh, what I enjoyed writing in 1971 uh, was his encounter with uh, Kissinger. I mean, the transcripts are there in his archives, you know, and they make for fascinating reading. Uh, what is also not known is how the Indo-Soviet Treaty, the twists and turns which the Soviet Treaty was actually conceived of in 1969 by D.P. Dhar uh, and Marshal Gretschko. But, you know, it was finally signed only in 1971. And yeah, that uh, that's after Kissinger's, is, yeah. after Kissinger's, you know, flight from Rawalpindi to, to Beijing, the geopolitics changed. What has never been brought out, which I claim some, you know, I can claim immodestly, that Mr. Huxer actually retired from government on the 4th of September 1971, at the height of the crisis. He just retired because he was 58 years old and he went on leave preparatory to retirement. He took, you know, three months leave. Uh, and by, but by the 24th or 25th of October 1971, Mrs. Gandhi gets him back and she says, you must come with me to, you know, the Western capitals, the six Western capitals, including Washington, her famous visit with Nixon. So he comes back. He's technically on leave when uh, Indira Gandhi is meeting uh, Nixon on the 4th of November 1971 in the White House. There, there was Kissinger from the American side and there was Huxa from the Indian side. Huxa is secretary to Indira Gandhi on leave. He's actually gone on leave preparatory to retirement. Uh, and on the 4th of December 1971, after Pakistan has attacked uh, India the previous night, uh, he gets reappointed as principal secretary to the prime minister. So those, there are many stories of 1971 that have, re have really, he was determined to leave in 1971. So from, it was not as Manishankar no, no, claims in the view that it was basically a cloak and dagger uh, no, no, from, act. No, from 1970, from, from January 1971, he's telling Indira Gandhi he wants to leave. In May 1971, he writes a letter to D.P. Dhar saying that for the next phase of Indira Gandhi, I am not the man. This is the phrase he uses. For the next phase of Indira Gandhi, I am not the man. But then I think what happens is people like D.P. Dhar, Aruna Asaf Ali, Nikhil Chakravarti, Mohan Kumar you know, the, 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 the left lobby, uh, uh, in, in a good sense, I'm not using the word lobby in a derogatory sense, uh, the left network uh, prevailed upon him, uh, I think, to stay back. back. The other part of it which doesn't come through here, but you might have got some, you must have seen some archival material in it. I believe in the, the Prime Minister Secretariat, there was a team which was monitoring continuously the Seventh Fleet. And this is what Arunduti. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have uh, you know, he calls the American uh, Shadid affair 
uh, and uh, you know on the 15th of December 1971 there's a and the record of the meeting I was able to get from the archives of the State Department uh, yeah there are some conversations uh, on that but um, yeah I mean the internal military details I did not get into because you know Srinath has done it Already Gary done. Bass also have done it I didn't get into that uh, but uh, you know the exchanges that he and Manek Shaw had, the humorous exchanges that they had in 1971, and then after 1971, uh, how Manek Shaw, you know, and Huxer, uh, Manek Shaw was trying to become field marshal, and you know the, the, that whole episode, you know, all that is comes there. out here. Yeah. The other part of the story is, of course, the emergency, as you, yeah, absolutely. as you also have dealt with the passing, the emergency, but more about Huxer and what happens to Huxer. Yeah, this, as I said, again, this is not about the emergency. It's about what happens to Huxer during the emergency. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 so it's from a Huxer-centric point yeah. of view. And I've actually castigated Mr. Huxer. Uh, you know, I've actually uh, said that he may have suborned himself, you know. They, he may have committed perjury uh, when he went to the Allahabad High Court in February of 1975 and gave testimony on the Yashpal Kapoor affair. In fact, uh, people don't realize that there were six charges uh, against Mrs. Gandhi uh, under the, you know, the, uh, the Representation of People's Act uh, f for the 1971 victory, Rajnarayan. Uh, there were six charges. Uh, Justice Sinha uh, exonerated Indira Gandhi on four out of those six charges and she was held guilty on two charges. The first charge was that the state government had put up rostrum and dais for a public meeting. A rather ridiculous and ludicrous charge if you ask me. And the second one was that Yashpal Kapoor, who was her OSD, had drawn a salary uh, for two weeks when he was a government servant. Uh, and that the, on these two charges, you know, she was held guilty. Now, Mr. Huxer, as the archival evidence suggests, um, accepted the, uh, resig the resignation was given on the 13th of January 1971 but he accepted it orally uh, and uh, for the next 14 days uh, you know uh, Mr. Uh, Yashpal Kapoor functioned um, but he didn't got, get a salary but uh, the written evidence was that the uh, resignation was effective from on a written record from the 27th of January 1971. So, um, you know, I've reproduced the, the, what happened in the Allahabad High Court, which I was able to get courtesy Prashant Bhushan, uh, whose father was appearing for Raj Narayan, and he had kept meticulous records. Uh, but Mr. Huxa, I think, uh, was less than, uh, less, you know, I think he was trying to defend Indira Gandhi, frankly, you know. He didn't want her to get into serious trouble. But as it turned out, she did get into serious trouble on the Yashpal Kapoor affair. Uh, and that became one of the two charges. During the emergency, by the way, um, uh, you know, he was actually driving from uh, uh, from somewhere in Himachal to Chandigarh the day the emergency was declared, the morning of the 26th. He was not there in the cabinet meeting. Uh, you know, he may well have spoken out, but would he have resigned on the emergency? I doubt it. I mean, I raised no, that question. No, I think his loyalty, yeah, was it public absolutely loyalty was such yeah. that he would not undermine her. He, he, he differentiated the personal, you know, that's why even though the Pandit brothers were raided uh, in the middle of July, he continues and then he comes and tells his wife, you know, I, I sat through the cabinet meeting and looking at Indra in her face she and she avoided my, so my the gaze. the issue for him was the role of a public servant yes, absolutely. as distinct from what his personal uh, yeah. views and emotions would have been. Yeah. On I mean, he played, he played the, what I was surprised to discover, he plays a very important role in the announcement of the 20-point program. You in said fact, the, the entire 20 10 points yeah, are from the that. 10 points of but the to be fair again to Mr. Huxer, that was not after the emergency. He had given that note before. No, he had given Gandhi, that note before the emergency, but she used it. She used it, yeah. No, but I, I, you are also said that the basic rupture started with Sanjay Gandhi right from England. Actually, 65. Because when he was local guardian to, Indra, to Rajiv and uh, Sanjay Gandhi, he was able to build a rapport with Rajiv Gandhi. But and no, that so rapport extended till 87. Uh, remember one uh, one thing that Mr. Huxer did in eighty seven when he was virtually half blind, uh, he uh, was sent by Rajiv Gandhi as a special envoy to begin the process of reconciliation with China, uh, and which culminated in the historic visit of Mr. Gandhi to Beijing in December eighty eight. So he and Rajiv Gandhi had you know I think personal fondness for each other. 
but he never struck a rapport with Sanjay. Uh, and that, I think, tension was evident. And in 1968, um, you know, when Sanjay Gandhi's dreams of becoming the Henry Ford of India, uh, you know, get unveiled, uh, I think Mr. Huxa uh, hits the ceiling and uh, tells Mrs. Gandhi, uh, for which I have actually found written evidence that uh, uh, India does not need passenger cars. India That's needs a political position at one level. But yeah. I think the bigger issue for both Sanjay Gandhi, Mr. Huxa, and the Prime Minister was that it's going to compromise the Prime Minister. No, no, no. I'm coming to that. There were two reasons. I'm mean, coming to that. You preempted what I was going to say. The first reason was that India does not require passenger cars. It requires an efficient public transport system. If at all, we need to produce more scooters. And that's how Scooters India, you know, was established. So that's the one ideological objection he had. But the second objection is that uh, the Prime Minister's son should not be sitting in the Prime Minister's house, living in the Prime Minister's house and having these contacts with all these less than desirable characters, uh, you know, to build the car, to, you know, if it's a business proposition, it should be done independently. So that, I think, the first one could have been handled. But I think the second one was something that upset the equilibrium. Uh, and from 68, this starts. It boils over in 1970. In September of 1970, when Sanjay Gandhi is given the letter of intent, uh, the first step in the production, at those time you had letter of intent and you had a license and then you had the actual production, he gets the letter of intent in September of 1970 and the file does not go through Mr. Haksa. That's what I have, you know, shown. Uh, it, it was directly Dinesh Singh was the minister of industry at that time. It goes to the, it goes to Mrs. Gandhi. So from 70, it then builds up. It really builds up. Uh, but, you know, um, um, uh, as I said, in 71, he wants to leave. He's prevailed upon to stay. Uh, and then in 72, he continues. But the writing is on the wall. And by December of 72, I, he writes to her. C contrary to what all biographers have written to give Indira Gandhi uh, her due, she did not get rid of him. Uh, he uh, voluntarily left her. Uh, but, you know, she continued to use him. Uh, but it's very, very clear, the relations yeah, post the, the Maruti, the change, shall we change, say, change. change. And no, uh, it was not just Maruti, Prabir. It was also the magnificent victory that Indra had in the March 1971 election, the victory over uh, Pakistan in 71, where she is hailed as Durga by no less a man than Dr. Bihari Vajpayee. Vajpayee. So, you know, Mrs. Gandhi had, she was no longer the cautious, tentative, Indira Gandhi, who needed uh, Haksa, the ideological uh, and moral compass. This was an Indira Gandhi who had won two-thirds majority uh, from the Indian people. She had won a magnificent victory over Pakistan. I asked Haksa Saab this question. Yes. Why did she call for the elections? Because yeah. opposition at the time had really sort of decided that they were no longer going to be able to do anything. Their organizations had been broken. The left was becoming <coughs> an org uh, underground organization. But everybody thought the emergency was here to stay for about 10 years, 5 years, 10 years. As I said, I was then still her guest. So I remember those conversations. And I don't think people expected the elections to take place so quickly. And when it did take place so quickly, there were actually quite a lot of debate whether they should participate or not, because the expectation was that she would actually win. And I asked Bhaksa Sab this question, ki why did she declare elections? She said, well, you know, she didn't win in the South. So a lot of her advisors were right in thinking there was a lot of support for the emergency, except that in different parts of the country, the responses were very different. Well, uh, I have discussed this at some length. And my view is that uh, Bhutto's calling for elections in Pakistan was an important factor in getting Indira Gandhi to declare elections in India. She could not be less democratic. She could, how, could, how could Pakistan have elections and India not have elections? Uh, if you look at the timing, her timing, uh, announcement of the elections of 1977, a few days after Bhutto's announcement, a few days. Do you think uh, it goes back to Oxford days? I'm joking. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, no I, don't, I don't think they knew each other. I mean, although they struck a good rapport in 1972 in Simla, uh, they did strike a good rapport in uh, at in this thing, and uh, in 1973, when Haksar and Bhutto meet, uh, they, you know they exchange warm words on Indira Gandhi. Um, you know, you know, incidentally, Bhutto uh, is a peculiar individual. 
I discovered, which I have not used in this book, uh, thanks to Shankar Bajpai, uh, who shared with me an extraordinary document that Bhutto wrote at the death of Nehru in 1964. And it was immediately suppressed. But uh, Mr. Bajpai got a copy and I discovered actually this copy in uh, the Haksara archives. Uh, then I asked Mr. Bajpai because it was sent to uh, Mr. Haksar by Mr. Bajpai, you know. <laughs> And it's an extraordinary document. Uh, if you read it, you, Huxer, uh, Bhutto is uh, actually uh, praising Nehru for many of the things that Mr. Nehru did. Secularism, democracy, parliament, planning, all these things. He was critical of India. But, you know, his, fond, his admiration for Nehru comes out. So, I, going, going back to the story, I think um, Bhutto's announcement of elections in Pakistan uh, cannot be ignored in any calculus that we do on why Indira Gandhi uh, called for election. The story is that um, uh, Mr. Sanjay Gandhi didn't want the elections to be called and yet uh, he, she called for the elections. Basically, maybe she was convinced in January, although the evidence seems to suggest that by February or March, after the campaigning in North India, it had become clear to her that she was going to lose. Yes. I lose. think January the expectation was different. Yes. By February, March, everybody Absolutely. was surprised Absolutely. in the reaction. Two things happened in February, Prabir, if you recall. In, two things happened in February 77. One is that uh, Jagjivan Ram and Bahuguna formed the uh, Congress for Democracy. That was a big dhaka. In fact, Haksar meets um, Indira Gandhi the day the CFD is formed. And, you know, I've recorded that conversation which is there in our. Uh, Gujral's diaries. And the second thing that happens is Mrs. Gandhi starts campaigning in North India. And it's very clear. The Absolutely. writing is on the wall. Absolutely. I think the result of March 1977 may have been a surprise to her advisors, but it was not a surprise to Indira Gandhi. Last question that. By the way, one small point on this election. In November 1979, November 1979, Haksar writes a letter to Arjun Sen Gupta, who was then in Oxford, that Indira Gandhi is going to come back with a bang. I, I've, read, I've read that letter. Remember, yes, I yes. mean, nobody expected her to come back in January 80. In fact, Pranoy Roy uh, and Ashok Lahiri made their name because they were the only guys who they were... They predicted, uh, I think, three, no. Uh, they were the first ones to predict. They were the first ones to predict an overwhelming mandate. Yeah. But in November 79, uh, Mr. Huxer writes to Arjun Sen Gupta saying there is no way that Mr. Gandhi is going to come back with a bang. Last question to you, you know, we have to evaluate Huxer's role in Indian history. Do you think this book, in fact, brings out today for a generation which never knew Huxer, that this brings out some of the elements that we need to take into account for evaluating his role? Well, certainly. I think, you know, Mr. Huxer was a man of his ages. I mean, he was an unrepentant Marxist. He yes. was a strong ideologue, strong votary of the public sector. He wanted scooters to be manufactured in the public sector. That's why Scooters Scooters India was set up uh, in Lucknow. The public was where it was set up. Yeah. And it really didn't take off. Yeah, yet. it didn't take off, but it got established. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, he picked up a huge battle with Ashok Mehta uh, on ONGC, uh, you know, on Bombay High. Uh, they wanted to go with Teneco, which is the American company, but he fought for... ONGC and that's how you know ONGC emerged as a big company. He was an unabashed champion of the public sector. Shall I, the continuation of this question, do we miss people in the government of his cloth? 100%. That, that is 100%. what we don't have I think do. the greatest quality that he had, uh, just the epigraph, I just want to read only the epigraph. Uh, when shall loyalty unshaken and candid truth ever find a peer to him? This is from Horace, an ancient Latin. I think you need people at the top who have the courage of their conviction to speak their minds, irrespective of what the consequences may be, who are open to different points of view. By the way, Mr. Huxer may have been an ideologue, but he listened to different points of view, uh, distilled it, you know, gave it his own color, but he gave a sense of that people were being heard. At the top, every prime minister requires a huxer, you know, every prime minister, every leader, every everybody, uh, you know, who goes in public life. 
because flattery and sycophancy comes naturally in in our culture right also the other thing about mr haksa which i think we have lost the 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 loyalty to the written word as you said right at the beginning we are an oral culture the difference between brijesh mishra who is the only one who comes closest to mr haksa as principal secretary mr brijesh mishra did not leave behind a written record like mr haksa has which is very important you know he would jot down everything he would write his notes he would write his letters you know uh, and thankfully they are all now in the public domain <laughs> Thank you very much, Jairam, to be with us. Thank you. And we hope that we will encounter you in News Click on many other Thank issues you. where we agree as well as disagree. Thank you. This is all the time we have in News Click today. Keep watching News Click and also visit our website or YouTube page.